you know, you were just listening to uh, Leon Russell and uh, made me think about what you told me about his vocal style. Tell me where he got that from. From Bonnie Bramlett. He was trying to figure out about his singing. And he was, uh, he, he asked me one time about my, uh, if I could tell him what my dad did when he preached, you know, how he, you know, how he carried on and everything. And, uh, but he, he uh, was trying to get his voice together and he liked how Bonnie, that hey, he, no, yeah. you know, uh, and I, I was listening to a song for you just now. I thought it was uh, the original because uh, that's Bonnie and Delaney and, and me singing the backgrounds on it. You know, don't fly away. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, but, it's beautiful. Yeah, it was really beautiful. I was glad to have known Leon. He was a real, a real straight shooting dude, you know. Yeah. You know. Well, how close were you and Leon? We didn't go hanging out together, you know. He, he was at a whole other level than me, you know. I just had gone to meaning what? Meaning that he came in from like the the that bunch of Carol Kay and all those folks like that. The, Right. The what do they call him? The session. The, yeah, session. session. You know, he's one of the top guys. You know, and uh, and so I mean, he was at a whole other level of musicianship and everything than I was. You know, I mean, he had already. He was a little on Sky Hill Drive, and his house was just full of big snakes running up the stairs, and every place was you mic'd mean, off. And you mean was, recording equipment? Is yeah, all of his uh, recording equipment was just everywhere. I mean, so he was at a uh, he and Mark Benno were doing the Asylum Choir, and uh, so I was. I came in. I was. I was at a whole other level than than them, not knowing that I was on the same level, but just a different uh, a different page of that level. Right. Uh, you know, um, I did think that, but I, I used to think that because I didn't know what I was doing, that I didn't know what I was doing, but. Uh, my uh, so ignorance in, to the uh, music world was bliss because I didn't know uh, how all those things happened and how things went and came and went and came and how you grew. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize it until after uh, and looking back in retrospect, I, I see now, you know, what influence everyone had on me and what influence I had on them. Uh, right. I mean, don't discount yourself even now, you know. What, no, what no. You, I'm, you had a natural ability uh, with so many things, actually. I mean, Delaney was trying to take part of that from you. And Well, everybody, you know, uh, everything's open for everybody to grab a little bit of, you know. You can't get everything. But uh, well, it seemed like you were, uh, you know, you were sort of being used a lot be, because you didn't know. Yeah, because. well, yeah, 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 and, and that's all right because I learned, and uh, you, you got to start out not knowing to, to ever find out. You know, yeah, but it's you not, don't know what you don't know until you do, and then you found out. Sometimes, it, and it's never too late. It doesn't matter if you're seventy-three. It's, that's how old I am. It's never too late. You know, uh, what you didn't not. know when you were young. Of course not. That's part of your experience, you know. That's another rung in the ladder, you know. But m my point was that people were taking unusual advantage of you because you didn't know a lot of stuff, so. Yeah, well, you know. Which is not the case now. But. And, uh, no, it's not the case now, but I knew I was being used and taken advantage of. I sensed it. I could feel it. Uh, I, 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 uh, that doesn't mean that, because there's nothing I could do about it except live through it, follow follow my path, the, and, and recognize the brambles and the thorns, you know, and... Don't walk over that way too far, this way too far. Just stay on my straight and narrow, 
you know, no matter how rocky it may have been or how rocky it is even today. Well, know? let me ask you, uh, your involvement with uh, Delaney and, and the other one, uh, what what was your involvement beginning to, to end of that? At the end of D&B? No, from the beginning to the end because... Uh, well, the beginning, I was the very first friend. It started out with Delaney, Bonnie, and me. That was it. Right. Uh, just the three of us, and, and no band. And then, then uh, J.J. Kale, Jimmy Carstein, and Carl Radle uh, was our band. Leon came, came and played with us a couple of times. Uh, but I was in there from the very, very beginning, and I witnessed it all go down. They, uh, uh, they had uh, me with Delaney and Bonnie pretty much at all times because I presented a, a family image to them. You know, I made them look more... <laughs> uh, now, where did you get that idea? Where did that come from? Alan Pariser. He oh, told really? me. Yeah, he said, he, I, I make them look more wholesome. See, uh, um, nobody knew what was going on behind the scenes, but I made Delaney and Bonnie look more wholesome. You know, uh, oh, well, you the three quite, of us, me you and my young self. Quite you know? young at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so how long did that whole scene last? I don't know. I, you know, I never really thought about it. A couple of years. You know, I was with them from, I think I was uh, 19, may have been 18 and just turned 19, uh, so 20, 21, um, and then... 22, I, I was gone, you know, and went to be with Eric. And, so and were were they breaking up when you left? Well, uh, they were, you could see it after the fact because it was a knockdown drag out all the time and it was a lot of arguing, a lot of fuss and a lot of fighting. You know, of course, all the alcohol and drugs didn't help anything. So of the original band, you were the last one to leave. Yeah, I was the last to leave. First, I was the first one there and the last one to go. When everybody else, uh, I mean, they bailed ship like running like lemmings to the sea <laughs> when we finished the, the European tour. Why was, why was, hang on. So they ran. Uh, why, why did everybody run? They had uh, all had plans on uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen. They already had a plan, and they were talking about it on the bus. Delaney and Bonnie were sitting up here, and everybody was talking about what they're getting ready to do. <laughs> they would leave Delaney and Bonnie and do Mad Dogs and Englishmen with Joe Cocker and Leon. And Delaney and Bonnie were so involved in themselves that they didn't even hear or see or recognize or acknowledge what was going on two feet from them, you know. It's like they had blinders on and mufflers, you know. Uh, and you heard all this. And oh yeah, I was sitting right. I was sitting right back here on the bus, <laughs> and everybody was talking about what they're getting ready to do. Bobby Keys, everybody, they're leaving. They didn't ask me because they knew I was staying, and they already had Chris Stanton was going to be the uh, keyboard player. So you chose not to go. Why was that? Oh, um, I was the first friend. I felt like it was my my. I was loyal. I was loyal to my, my two friends, and we started it, you know, and uh, I guess we finished it. So your, your, your relationship was still good at the time. Yeah, my, my relationship was, was good with them after, even after I left. You know, even after I went on to be with Eric and, and we did what we were doing, I, was always, I would always go uh, see Delaney and Bonnie, and, and, our, and then when they split up, I would still go see uh, Delaney, you know, go visit. And how long was it before they split up after you had left? Not long. It wasn't too long. Were uh, they under contract to do something else? or? I don't know anything about the contracts, you know. Uh, with them, I knew that they <laughs> they were all probably pretty... They had a lot of holes in them, I'm sure, but uh, I didn't know anything about contracts in those days, you know. Uh, it was one of those things, you either signed it or you didn't. And if you didn't, you didn't have the gig, you know. And I couldn't negotiate anything. I'm sure everybody uh, <clears throat> had a different deal, you know. I'm sure they paid Jim Gordon more than $96.50 a week. Well, they were know. older. Than, <laughs> That's they what were, I made. They were older. When we were doing our, our, our European tour, 
$12 a day per diem and $96.50 a week. <laughs> it's just it's absurd. <laughs> but it, I wasn't there for the money, and it's a good thing I wasn't because there wasn't any coming my way. Well, uh, as you had mentioned before, they were older than you, more experienced. They had been in yeah. that scene for quite a while. Had been down the road, had signed all the bad deals, you know. That's why Delaney trying to hide everything. He already signed a bunch of bad deals. And right. he went from one bad deal to another to another while I was there, from Stax to Electro Asylum to Atlantic. You know, and it was like, wow, he would sign with somebody. He was already with somebody. He would sign with somebody else. That's illegal. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it might be illegal, but it was in the, in the Bramlett world, it was legal. <laughs> In Delaney's world, for you sure. You know, it's like Oprah says, if somebody tells you who they are, believe them. You know, he told me he was going to steal from me, you know. <laughs> There's nothing, what are you going to do? You say, no, I'm going to clam up. I'm not going to create in front of you. you know? Well, it that brings up, you know, I'm not going to say anything about anybody in particular, but your song, Where There's a Will, There's a Way. Can you explain how you, how that was written? I asked Delaney one time about... Uh, I said, how do you write uh, a rock and roll song? I said, all I can write is these ballads, like I'd written Dreams of a Hobo, <laughs> you know, and Thorn Tree in the Garden. But he wrote these great rock and roll songs. I said, how do you how do you go about that? He said, just change the beat and, and the tempo, you know. And I went, I said, that's it? He said, yeah. He said, yeah. I went home. I was living in John Garfield Jr.'s uh, house. Bobby Keys had the the, the uh, guest house on top, and, and it was Michael and Sheila Visseltier had the bottom, and uh, there was a grand piano there, and I was living there, and uh, I went home uh, and, uh, after talking to Delaney about this this songwriting thing, and I sat down at the piano, and my first wife Kathy. Hardly ever said a word, you know. I don't. I don't remember one thing she ever said, and so I sat down uh, uh, to the. Uh, it was one of those teenage marriages, you know. Uh, she was from where I, I was from, and uh, it lasted like six months or something. It seemed like six years, but uh, I went. I went home <laughs> after talking to Delaney about that, and I, I just started sit down at the piano and I just, you know, honey, when we're together, it seems like we both got a whole lot of nothing to say. But I know if we try, we can work it out someday. I know if we try, we can work it out someday. And I believe if there's a will, shun off on another way. Yeah. If there's a will, Showing up, there's gotta be a way. There ain't no need to worry. There's nothing's wrong. It just ain't the time or place. And you can believe nearly every word I say. <laughs> you can believe nearly every word I say. All that just came out. Yeah, that's how it works with me, anyhow. It's yeah, just, well, I know. You know, it just spills out. You know, I'll be pondering on something in the next well, thing and then you what? Know. Then what happened? I called Laney and I played it over the telephone. I said, listen to this. And I put the phone up on top of the piano and played and sang it. He said, man, that's great. We're going to do this next week, you know. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to finally get to sing a song in the band. No, uh -uh. he sang it. He sang my song. But he put a, a, a he arranged it to where... Dun, 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 where there was a middle section, midsection that right. went off, and it was a real cool thing, you know, for the song. But he arranged it that one section and added it, and then gave himself and Bonnie credit <laughs> for uh, writing it. I went, wow! On top of being like totally dis disillusioned about going to sing my song, finally I get to sing. He sang it, he took it, and they put their names on it. And I just went, what are you going to do? It's after it's, it, the damage is done. 
So uh, there's and, nothing and I could do. But you, Bonnie, or neither Bonnie nor Delaney were anywhere near me when I wrote that song. Nowhere near me. Never. They never heard it until I sang it. And it wasn't sung until I had written it and I lived it. I was living it at that moment. You know. Uh, did did Kathy know that the song was about her and your your relationship? Uh, well, I don't know. We didn't ever really talk about those things. <laughs> I wrote a couple of songs that were in relation to our relationship with her. But what I, was the other one? Uh, a game called Life, and uh, the scenery has slowly changed. Oh my God! Such beautiful songs. Yeah, I wrote I wrote both of those upstairs in a bedroom at Hurtwood Edge when I got there, and I went downstairs. And I played, I played, I wrote one one night and one the other night, the next night. And uh, I went down the stairs and I played them for Eric. And he said, wow. <laughs> he said, when did you write that? I said, just finished it a while ago, you know. And then, <laughs> and then I, on Scenery of Slowly Changed, he said, he asked me, he said, wow. <laughs> he said, again, you know, uh, who showed you those chords? I said, I just made them up. And it is scenery is in an open E, but it's a fistful of a chord. <laughs> it's a it fist, sure is. It's a fistful. I don't know how I did it. Just like da 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 da. I found that sounded good, and then if I move it here, what it'll be like, you know. But that's how it worked with me. It's always been like that with me, you know. Well, when I, I, I when I wrote Dreams of a Hobo, I was sitting in the front yard, surrounded by. Uh, uh, White clover. It was beautiful. I, I can smell it right now. But um, used to used to take those things and you could tie them together and make a rope out of them. Yeah. And uh, I was sitting there and I could just imagine, you know, a, a hobo. You know, dreams of a hobo. He tells a story soft and sweet as he walks through the flowers with bare feet and sits and talks. You know, and I say to myself of yesterday because I was that hobo. Uh, and how it used to be and about tomorrow, it's, you know, wish I had something to eat, the dreams of a hobo, you know. It's a beautiful song. He said, well I, well, I guess that I had better move on down the line. Mr. Say, I'm sorry, but I need a nickel and a dime. A nickel for some coffee and a dime for a call. I got to find my woman if I got one at all. That's when coffee really was a nickel and the phone was a dime. <laughs> 